Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Track 2, Legislative and Medical Advocacy. I am Melissa Hogan, and I will be your host for the last breakout of the summit. As a reminder, this track is being live streamed, and I would like to welcome our remote attendees and remind everyone to download the mobile app and to use some of the highlighted features like the live Q&A um, for questions at the end of the presentation. Our last breakout session will be presented by Julia Jenkins, Executive Director for the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases, and Aaron Fry, Senior Director of Ex External Affairs and Business Development at Babies, and Kim Tuminello, Director of Advocacy at the Association for Creatine Deficiencies. They will be leading our session, Advocacy for the Community Newborn Screening. Please join me in welcoming them. All right, so can you guys hear me? Um, I wanted to thank uh, Global Genes for focusing on newborn screening. It's very exciting. Um, also wanted to thank the panelists because I uh, gave them gave Global Genes your name. So uh, appreciate you guys taking that on. Um, so I will start. Uh -oh. if I push play. How do I? Anybody back there know how to make this thing work? Um, all right, okay. So uh, just a little bit about the foundation. You guys uh, heard the last um, panel talk a little bit about our programs, but um, wanted to go over. We're a science-based advocacy organization. Um, we work on uh, bringing life-saving treatments to the 30 million Americans with rare diseases. We have four main policy goals, but the one I'm gonna talk about today is number two. Um, which is making sure patients receive earliest access to diagnostic and treatment opportunities. Um, and that is means enhancing newborn screening policies at both the state and federal levels. Um, all right, are we working now? Yes. Um, so none of you guys care about the saving money part, but when we message this to our state legislators, we message that newborn screening saves lives and money. Um, all of you know about the diagnostic odyssey and challenges for the rare disease community. Um, and how critical it is to get diagnosed early um, to save lives. We also know that um, a lot of the, the rare disease therapies can help the progression of the disease, but they don't reverse the um, horrible things that can happen to uh, these children. And we, we wanna make sure that children are getting access um, as soon as possible to these life-saving therapies before any adverse effects, which is why newborn screening is very critical. Um, all right, so one of the things that we use um, as a talking point, um, ALD is one of the diseases that was recently added to the RUSP, um, and it is um, uh, screened for but in a few states, but a lot of states are still not screening for this disease. But we actually use the talking point, well, the treatment costs this, but actually end-of-life care for a child with um, ALD is, can exceed $3 million. So why not treat the child di by diagnosing early and save that $3 million in costs. Um, so um, this is the bad news. We have a 50-state newborn screening program. Every state does things differently. Um, there is a federal committee of experts. It's called the RESP. It's the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel. Um, so this expert committee under the HHS, um, which is the Health and Human Services, um, basically reports to the secretary and recommends specific diseases. They're, they're not slow, they're very, or they're slow, they're very thorough. Um, it's actually very challenging to get a disease on the rest, but we have Kim here who is a rock star and she's gonna be getting her disease on the rest pretty soon. Um, she's gonna share with you how to do that. Um, but once you get your disease on the rest, states can take up to eight years to start screening for the diseases that the federal government recommends. Most states you have to pass new legislation um, which means that once parents have had to do all the work to get their disease on the rest, they didn't have to go state by state to add their new diseases. Um, and it's, it, it varies. So some states screen for nearly 60, some as few as 29. Um, and these legislative delays are what we focus on improving. We want to make that those go away. Um, and, and we really believe that babies should not live or die based on their zip codes. So our solution, we want to, at a minimum, we, we would love for states to screen for much more than what's on the RUSP, but at a minimum, 
that all states are screening for the federally recommended diseases, and that we're eliminating the legislative today, delay in going state by state, disease by disease. That's an unnecessary burden, um, and we want to make sure that um, we are implementing these screenings in the state as soon as possible. Um, we also want to be able to empower patients to get their diseases added to the RUSP. Um, I will say, um, we want to, we're doing the state stuff first. Um, there's a lot of improvements that need to be done at the federal level to improve the RUSP. But if we improve the RUSP and make it work a lot better, um, then states will be less likely to implement these legislative fixes um, because they'll be afraid of adding too, too many new diseases. So these are our projects. Um, we are driving legislation. Right now we're doing one state per, per year. We'd love to increase that. Um, we are going to be launching a state-by-state -state advocacy toolkit to empower um, advocates to drive legislation in their state. So there's 50 states. We've only done two. We don't want to take 50 years to do this. We want to help all of you um, drive this legislation in your state. Um, we're also going to be creating an action center um, so that you can come to one place and find out all the different newborn screening legislation that's going on at both the state and the federal level. Um, on October 4th, we're going to have Kim again, but a few other uh, great advocates, both in industry um, and in patient organizations, talk about how they have gotten diseases or how they're working to get diseases onto the RUSP and really go over the criteria. Um, basically, um, an hour long of Kim's presentation, maybe an hour and a half, um, but really for those who want to deep dive into how to do the, the work from the very beginning um, to, to get your disease on the RUSP. Um, and then we are also doing, at the federal level, um, a caucus briefing on the diagnostic challenges uh, for rare diseases, which will highlight newborn screening because we'll talk about it a little later, but we're going to be reauthorizing the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act next year in Congress. Um, so collaboration is key to our success. We actually have a community congress program. Um, it is uh, co-chaired by a member of the patient community and a member of industry. And we have three working groups, and our newborn screening working group is actually what is driving um, our newborn screening initiative. So these are really things that we're hearing from the working group of what they would like to see us do. Um, we launch things, they give us feedback, we improve them. Um, so a little bit about what we did. Um, our fir first bill was last year in California. Um, we chose California uh, because we were located in California, so kind of cheating. Um, but there was the largest number of babies born in the U.S., uh, in California, um, and so it was a, a great example. It's also a very large state. Um, other states tend to follow what California does, so it was a great kind of model um, state. So we introduced um, uh, our legislation by Dr. Richard Pan. We were very, very fortunate that we had a pediatrician in the state legislator, le legislature. If you have a pediatrician or even a physician in your state legislature, friend them. Stalk them, Facebook friend them. Make sure they understand your disease, but they're really the, the key to making things happen because not only are they your best advocates, but um, a, the other legislators tend to defer um, to medical issues to the um, one person who kind of knows them. Um, we, the, the California legislation basically required the state to implement new diseases that were added to the rest within two years. Um, and that was a lot of different reasons because um, they needed time to get the appropriations and to purchase the equipment, and hire the people in order to start screening. Um, it was passed unanimously through um, the Assembly and the Senate, which is very exciting. Um, and the state will begin screening for MPS and Pompeii by September 18th. Um, we also had another victory in Florida earlier this year. Uh, it was also passed unanimously um, in about three months. But uh, to be fair, uh, the legislature only meets for three months, so we only had three months to do it. Um, we also were able to secure appropriations for implementation, implementation of ALD um, and uh, new funding for their genetic center. And then the Florida Advisory Committee will be meeting um, to uh, consider Pompeii and MPS1 in 2018. So when I talk about a 50 state, everything, everyone does something differently. Um, in Florida, our California legislation would have actually been unconstitutional um, because the, Florida does not let their government um, defer to the federal government. So we empowered um, the State Advisory Council. Um, we both empowered them and then also required them to review the diseases. Um, and then we also allowed for the use of non-FDA approved tests because that was something that was holding up screening in Florida. Um, it wasn't that easy. Uh, we, there's lots of, uh, as a public health program that newborn screening is, there's lots of challenges 
Um, lots of concerns about cost, about the, the kits and the reagents. Um, I'm not a scientist, but we, and we have um, babies here to talk about kind of the, the technology. Um, and they're doing some really innovative stuff that could change um, the, the landscape for this. Um, the cost of treatment is a huge issue. Um, these treatments are typically life-saving, um, and they tend to not be uh, inexpensive, uh, to say the least. But um, really, as we talked about end-of-life care of $3 million, you can have a, a perfectly healthy child and pay for the treatment, or you can have um, paid all this money and, and have someone who needs critical help for the rest of their lives. Um, hospital associations, Department of Public Health, um, those are all potential stakeholders, um, and they tend to be not in support of doing more work. Um, so uh, it's, that's a, always a challenge. Um, some of the federal issues about newborn screening, um, fun times, the Trump administration, not surprisingly, actually com completely eliminated funding for HRSA, which is where the newborn screening federal program is. Um, it also reduced funding for the CDC's newborn screening quality assurance program. Um, some other federal, March of Dimes typically runs the uh, federal um, rep appropriations request every year. You have to do this every year. Um, asking for money to make sure this program exists. Um, and then we also have the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act reauthorization next year. Um, there was um, some issues with the last uh, reauthorization five years ago. Some very anti-scientific language was put in. Um, we want to make sure that you all are aware that this is coming. If you all care about newborn screening, then um, we need to be activated and ready to mobilize um, in case there is other additional um, language that could be put in. And there are concerns with Congress. Um, there's anti. There's people that are concerned with privacy, um, uh, and and all sorts of. It's it's like a ma a landmine sometimes uh, in this program. Um, just a quick. Um, kind of overview what's happening in other states. These aren't our initiatives, but I wanted to make sure you all were, knew what was going on. Um, so there was legislation passed uh, this year uh, in Georgia and in Missouri. Missouri is um, an activist state, which we love, um, that are screening for diseases that are not on the RUSP. Um, and then Washington, there was a regulatory decision made. Um, and this was a, a really cool situation where um, the committee actually recommended not to screen for Pompeii and the patient community mobilized, and we brought a patient in to testify um, and change the, the decision. Um, so it's key to making sure patients are in, involved in the process. Um, there was a bunch of other legislation that is still pending or stalled, um, so there's a lot of more work to do. Um, I see some of you guys taking pictures of these slides. I'm, I'm sure they'll be made available, but we also have all this information on our website. Um, these are cool pilot programs that are happening. Um, so people are aware of them. Um, some up, so how many of you here knew that September was Newborn Screening Awareness Month? All right, excellent. Um, but I do encourage you all who care about newborn screening to go to Baby's First Test to see how you can raise awareness for this critical issue because if we're going to be successful at both the state and federal, at the state and federal levels, people need to know why this program matters. We can't have an administration completely eliminating the whole program. Um, luckily, Congress said that budget was dead on arrival, um, but it does tell you what the priorities of the administration are, and we need to make sure that this is a, a priority. Um, the foundation is, is going to start hosting kind of a, here all the, the different things about um, what's happening with newborn screening and events. Here's some coming up, um, but you can check rarescreening.org, and we're going to be listing like the different conferences and any time that you guys can get involved in what's going on. Um, for those of you who want to get involved with the foundation on these issues, we invite you to join our newborn screening working groups um, at uh, Community Congress. There's an email. Actually, Stephanie's just right there. I'll just point her out. Um, you can talk to her if you're a patient organization. Um, and then you can contact Carol Kennedy if you are a industry partner. Um, uh, and then I also encourage you all to join us for Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. Um, we will be talking um, about reauthorization of Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act at the lobby day. So um, we want to make sure that that um, benefits patients this next time around. All right. I think we're doing questions at the end, right? Yeah. Look at that. It's a baby. Her name is Donna. We name our little pictures of babies. 
Um, I am Erin Fry. I'm the Senior Director of External Affairs and Business Development for, for Babies. I get to work for babies, where we believe that everyone deserves a healthy start. That's why the extra E in the name Babies. Um, so Babies is a um, startup company. We're about three years old. There's our team. And we were founded on Duke Research, and we're located in Durham, North Carolina. And we have over 300 patents for digital microfluidics and all kinds of things related to the medical devices that we're um, manufacturing and, and the electrowetting technology that I'm going to share with you so you can see a little bit about the new kid on the block, so to speak. Um, baby's sole focus is advancing newborn screening and pediatric testing. And so we have multiple products that are all focused on improving pediatric health care. So this is a picture of our first FDA authorized product. It's called Seeker. This is the first FDA authorized product that conducts lysosomal storage disorder um, enzyme deficiency tests. And so it's very, very small. What you're looking at there is a workstation and that would fit probably on one of the tables that you're at, maybe a little wider but that gives you a sense of the size of it. It'll, one of those things would fit into your carry-on suitcase. Um, it's typically configured like this, and it's meant to be in a state public health lab. So it's meant for high throughput, high volume um, newborn screening. And so now I'm gonna show you the tests that it does, or talk to you a little bit about it. So a little bit of background, lysosomal storage disorders. There's probably about 50 of them. Um, they're rare inherited metabolic disorders that result from defects in the lysosomal function. Um, they result when a specific organelle in the body cells, the lysosome, malfunctions. And so each LSD is rare, but together it's about one in four to 5,000 people has, um, has a LSD. So they're caused by this lysosomal dysfunction. It's usually the deficiency of an enzyme. And when the lipids or proteins that those enzymes are not breaking down, build up over time, it, it makes cells swell up and tissues start to malfunction and deteriorate. So many times babies seem healthy when they're born, um, but the buildup can affect the child's central nervous system, their cognitive ability and mobility, and any number of symptoms. And all of you, I'm sure, are highly aware of, of how that can be. Um, so that's a little bit of background on the four tests we have. This is a table that outlines the four, these four LSDs. Um, there are more than 1,000 babies that are born in the U.S. each year with these four, these four specific LSDs. Um, of the four LSD tests that babies offers, two of them are on the RUSP. And as you all know, Pompeii was added in 2015, and then MPS-1 was added in 2016. Other LSDs are very likely to be considered, but it is a very slow process. So our clinical study data, some of which you see here, was critical for the evidence review to get these conditions approved by the RUSP. And so I also show here the intended use statement. This is important. Even for us with the medical device that's FDA authorized, it's important that we make this statement very clear. Quantitative measurement of the activity of the enzymes, et cetera, you can read. Um, but each of these disorder res results in a deficiency of the specific enzyme shown. So that second column is the specific enzyme that we're looking for. So what's interesting about this slide is the incidence rates. There's the published incidence rates that you see there in the third column, and then surrounded in red is the incidence rates that we're finding on Seeker in Missouri. So Missouri is the you know, first one out of the gate on a lot of things. They are using the Seeker equipment and if you see there, we're finding one in 9,000 instead of one in 28,000 Pompeii babies. That's three times as many as they thought. Now, this is only one state. This data is published, um, but clearly it needs to be confirmed over and over again. But it's important to share this kind of information as, how, as part of what newborn screening can really um, shine a light on, right? It, as these drug companies, pharma companies are developing new, new treatments, if the incidence rate's higher, there's a lot of implications, um, reasons why that matters. 
For Fabre as well, we're seeing one in 3,000 about, and the published incidence is one in either one in 1,500 to 13,000. So these are much, much higher rates. Now we get to the good stuff. Can I have the video play? This is our cartridge. This goes inside of the seeker. It's a top-down picture of the cartridge on which these screenings are conducted. So this shows you how our proprietary technology, which is called digital microfluidics, actually works on the cartridge. This is for the four LSDs that we do. You can see across the top, Pompeii, Fabre, Gaucher, and Hunter. And again, this means that the digital microfluidics means that we can miniaturize our assays. So we're using less blood, less of the testing reagents needed, and that equates to less burden on babies and spending less money. Um, and we all know that state labs are very, very interested in saving money. It is that money piece that is making this stuff take so long. So it's, we're doing our part to make it less expensive. So as you can see, this is a simplification here. You can see these little blood, blood things moving. Maybe play it again if, if you can. Um, we'll do 160 tests on this cartridge. It's four tests for 40 babies. So on this one cartridge, 160 tests are happening at the same time. So we start with the blood spot, and then we extract the four tiny samples. That's the, the blood, the DBS extracts there on the right. And then we combine those samples with the reagent droplets that are coming down from the top. You can see them kind of match up there, and then they truck on down like Pac-Man down the pathways. While, that's, while that travel on that pathway is happening, that's when the test is incubating. And then at the end, the readouts come out, what's not shown on that video, that it keeps moving and comes down, and you can read it out on a, a it's a fluorescent result. So you can look through the optics and see if it's fluorescent. If it lit up, then that enzyme is working. And if it didn't lit up, if it doesn't light up, then it's not working. And this is our second product. It's up and coming. It's not approved yet. Um, it's called Finder. Um, this is our pipeline product. And so this equipment would not be used in a state lab. Seeker, the, one, the other one, is used for that high volume environment, whereas Finder is for newborn screening and pediatric testing for one baby, and that testing will be done near the baby. So this one too would fit in your carry-on bag if you took that screen off, probably. It's about the size of a big toaster. Um, so in a birthing center, in a hospital lab, or in the NICU, this is where the Finder would be used. So the cartridges that you remember, you just saw a cartridge, a differently configured cartridge goes into Finder and it's, it uses one drop of the baby's blood and it's only a tiny amount that is needed. Right now, a lot of times when they do these tests, they're taking vials of blood, 500 milliliters. We're doing nanoliter, very microscopic miniaturized tests, so only one drop. And then each cartridge has preloaded materials to conduct several different tests on one cartridge. So there are multiple tests for any particular problem can be done at the same time. So one example that I heard that I really like to use is um, for hypo hypercoagulability. So if you have a little baby that needs a heart surgery, um, that surgeon really wants to know the coagulability of the baby's blood before several times during and after the surgery. There are seven tests that can be done that maximize the doctor's knowledge about the baby's coagulability, but right now they have to draw a 500 milliliter vial of blood for, for every time they wanna conduct these tests, and the seven tests are not conducted right there by the baby, they're conducted maybe over here at the lab or there's a piece of equipment over here, so it's kind of all over the place. And so the doctor opts not to do all seven of those tests. So the docs at Boston Children's asked us to figure this out. And we have, there's several different kinds, it's what I mean by kinds of tests is you can do an immunoassay, um, a, maybe an enzyme test, you can do a biochemical test, or you know, all different kinds of tests on the same panel with that same one, one drop of blood. So this way, if this machine is next to that little baby having heart surgery, that doctor can know that baby's coagulability on one drop of blood in 10 minutes, all seven tests. 
So this will change the game. Now imagine there's a panel for hyperbilirubinemia. This is something you can't put on a dry blood, dry blood spot and send it to the public health lab because whatever is gonna show the jaundice is gone by the time the lab receives that dry blood spot. So our first panel that we'll release with the launch of um, Finder is gonna be four different tests that detect hyperbilirubinemia. Um, including the G6PD test, so we can get to those babies that have Curanicteris. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? So now I wanna talk about the problem. So I'm four months into babies, and when they hired me and I could figure this stuff out, I was just so excited and happy, if you can't imagine, to be working for babies. It's just wonderful. But quickly, I can see that you know, this is a very complex world, and the gray boxes there show how many conditions over the years the U.S. public health system has taken on. This is commendable. It's amazing. They've done a lot of great work, and what I'm saying is not to disparage them in any way, shape, or form. But what also happened is the FDA and other regulatory bodies started to approve um, and, and hasten the development of rare disease drugs. Well, that's great too, right? But now what you're having is this huge gap the blue there in the, in the not end bar is right now. There's all these FDA approved therapies that are not getting screened for, for various reasons. And we all understand the complexity of the RUSP decision making and all of that. But at the end of the day, we still have this gap. There are still all of these approved therapies. And then the peach color is all the pipeline therapies that are coming that don't yet have newborn screens. Now jump to five years from now, and that number, you and I both know, it's just going to keep increasing dramatically. So this gap is widening, and screening is really going to keep falling behind in the public health system construct. Um, so we definitely are on board with getting these things done more quickly, um, figuring out um, ways. So no one has all the answers to fix those problems, but we at Babies are thinking about what is uniquely ours to do, right? What is our... What can we do to help? And so number one is we can bring new tests to the market. We can develop assays to do new screenings for those treatments that you all are developing to, to put them into the newborn screening, you know, the, the, that capability exists. Uh, we can provide data for those conditions like we did with Pompeii and MPS1 to try to help that rust process hasten. Um, and like we said earlier, that data can show those higher incidence rates. That could have implications for cost of these treatments. There are any number of implications that that could enable. And then we can also participate in the advocacy process, supporting more screening and therapies for rare diseases alongside of you. So th while this is a huge problem, look, we're a startup company. That, to me, looks like a whole lot of opportunity. And um, we're not sitting around. <laughs> sure. So what's most important on this slide, I'm almost done. I just want to. Um, you know, give a little shout out to Georgia from North Carolina. Isn't that fun? Georgia from North Carolina. So she's dancing. And this is important because she was diagnosed in Missouri. She was one of the first babies diagnosed with Seeker um, who has Pompeii. And I just got to see her last month or a month and a half ago at the United Pompeii Foundation meeting. And she's just as cute now as she was when that picture was taken. And she's still dancing and running around like a normal baby. And that's significant because that muscle... Um, dysfunction in the legs is one of the first things a lot of times that shows up for Pompeii babies. So she does have to have ERT infusions, but she's, she's dancing, so rock on, Georgia. So when we identify the problem as a gap in newborn screening, we have to consider from the different points of view what is the value of newborn screening. I think when I talk to pharma companies, a lot of them don't really understand yet what is the value of newborn screening, or they think that that process is so long that it just doesn't matter, or they don't meet the criteria for the RUSP, right? So what role can we play, and what role can newborn screening play in fixing that gap of a problem? So for every one of us here, we all put the patient first, and that's why the patient's at the top of this list, but every one of those other constituents, all the things that are listed under them, th those are benefits of newborn screening that all lead back to that patient. So those children benefit from the things that we do to make newborn screening valuable. When family members can spend less time and money and heartache on that diagnostic odyssey, those kids benefit. When the providers know more 
about early development and early symptomology, those kids benefit. And when patients are identified for clinical trials and treatment, that's something that newborn screening can do too. Those kids benefit. So we're not limited to the US. I think that's another thing to keep in mind. Newborn screening is at different levels and different constructs in different countries, whether it's run by the government or not. And so it could be that part of closing that gap starts in other countries or happens simultaneously in other countries. So I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is just meant to show kind of the bureaucracy that exists. Um, so I had to set about when I started at Babies, set, you know, just like we all do, right, identifying all of the different stakeholders. And I quickly realized that, you know, from the advisory committee there at the bottom, if they say yes, then the health department has to say yes, then the government has to say yes, then they have to pass state legislation, they got to say yes, and that has to be a screening fee increase or an appropriation. This all takes forever, right? So guess who really doesn't care about that in a good way? Advocacy groups and pharma companies. So I put myself right between those two, and that's why I'm here. My role encompasses advocacy, government, and business development. And so we, we there in the middle, we all have a common focus on rare diseases. We can make newborn screening assays. We can help to pass legislation. And we can reduce the expense of screening. Our equipment is given to those public health labs for free. Free. We can just give it to you. Then it's a razor, razor blade model. They've got to pay for the reagents and the cartridges, but they don't have to spend a lot of money on a mass spec. And I'm not trying to put down mass spec. Mass spec is absolutely needed. But in certain situations where we're trying to speed up the process, this is a way that we are doing what is uniquely ours to do to enable that. So it, when pharma wants to develop therapies and identify those patients who need their treatments, when advocacy groups want to support families, encourage the development of those, that's where we can all work together to hasten this process. And there's Donna. And that's my contact information. So if you want to reach out to me and help me figure this out, I'm willing to talk. Thank you. Tim. Hello, good afternoon. Last track, last day, last speaker. <laughs> You're almost out of here. Um, hi, my name is Kim T. Manello. Um, I'm a co-founder for Association for Creatine Deficiencies and uh, director of advocacy currently. And I'm a mom of two children that both have GAMPT. Um, GAMPT is guanidino acetate methyltransferase deficiency. Um, unlike many diseases, this one is very easy and very inexpensive to treat, um, probably to the cost of maybe $20 a month. It's really inexpensive and very easy to test for. I know it's amazing. Uh, ACD goals are to eliminate the challenges of all creatine deficiencies. There are three. Um, specifically, we're looking to find a treatment for the creatine transporter disorder. Uh, and having newborns screen at the state and federal levels for GAMPT, AGAT, and CTD eventually. Uh, currently, our focus on newborn screening is GAMPT because it does have an FDA-approved treatment. Um, before I go any further, um, I'm curious, how many of you here have lobbied for newborn screening? Yeah, this is why you're sitting here, right? <laughs> um, all right. So RESP. RESP is the Recommended Universal Screening Program panel. Excuse me. It sets the standard for proactive care. Um, and as they mentioned, newborn screening uh, differs from state to state, and some will include more or less disorders, depending on what state you live in. Uh, but RESP is the national recommendation that guides and supports the states in their development of their newborn screening programs. Most states screen for all the disorders listed on RESP, but it is not law. Uh, it is up to the individual states to determine what they will screen for. Um, all of the states have somewhat of a different application process. If you've been advocating at your own state or some others, I'm sure you've already recognized that. Um, however, the RESP establishes uh, a standardized list of disorders that have all been well vetted and are supported by the Secretary of Health and Human Services and its committee. So we certainly hope that states will comply. And groups like Every Life Foundation is certainly doing their part in making sure that happens, which is fantastic. Uh, let's see. This is the decision matrix 
skipping ahead here, hold on, go back one. Uh, the criteria for a RESP. So as many of you know, many conditions that are included today in newborn screening no longer cause a serious impairment or illness that they, if they are treated properly after an early diagnosis. Today, of the 7,000 rare diseases, there are only 34 core conditions and 26 secondary conditions that are tested for on the RESP. And I want to mention also, uh, the secondary conditions are those that can be identified uh, either unintentionally with screening for one of the core conditions or coincidentally because of uh, the t confirmatory test that had an out-of-range result. Many of you probably know this, but I thought I'd mention it. So of the 34 disorders uh, that are currently on RESP uh, are all of those that cause serious development and intellectual disabilities or even death if they are not detected and treated early enough to prevent damage from the very beginning of life. The committee that works to set these national guidelines is called the Advisory Committee of Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children, otherwise known as the ACHDNC. To give you a little background, the committee meets quarterly in Bethesda, Maryland, and is made up of physicians and organizations that represent national public health constituencies, medical professional societies, and consumer family advocacy groups with a large involvement in newborn screening like Every Life Foundation. So the ACHDNC has a very big job. More than four million babies are born here in the U.S. every year. Uh, and a matter of fact, most states uh, report newborn screening participation of 99% or higher. Uh, the CDC data shows that about 12,500 newborns per year are diagnosed with one of the core conditions that are detected through the newborn screening on RESP. This means that almost one out of every 300 newborns uh, that are screened or diagnosed. So this is the decision matrix for the ACHDNC. Um, I don't expect you to be able to read this. Again, this will all be available to you. Um, but this is really how the disorders on the RESP are chosen. Um, there needs to be evidence that supports the potential net benefit of screening. The states need to have the ability to screen for the disorder. The health outcomes of the condition are well understood. There needs to be an available and effective treatment. The identification of the condition could affect the future reproductive decisions of the family. And the newest criteria that we were met with is that there has to be at least one confirmed newborn screen uh, of the disorder, either in an individual state or in another country, uh, before it will be added to the RESP. Uh, so from my standpoint, it felt a little backwards. It has to be caught on a newborn screen before they put it on the newborn screen, but of course this is where the, the pilots come in and going from state to state. So for a condition to be added to the RESP, <clears throat> you have to nominate it. Uh, the ACHDNC encourages individuals and organizations to form a multidisciplinary team to submit the nomination for a disorder to be considered. Your team should be include researchers or clinicians, which may be a part of your medical advisory board, uh, and that have the expertise on the condition being nominated. It should also include advocacy or professional organizations with knowledge of the issues relevant to the newborn screening, and interested in parents or individuals, of course. So I'm gonna give you a little step-by-step -step process um, of navigating through the RESP. Um, <clears throat> After the application is submitted, it moves to a nomination and prioritization work group to review the completed nomination package and compile a summary of the ACHDNC's consideration. Next, the committee <clears throat> then decides if sufficient evidence is available, whether to assign or not assign the nominated disorder to a condition review work group. Nominators whose conditions are not assigned would be provided with the feedback as to why not. If the condition is indeed moved to the condition review work group, they will complete a systematic evidence-based review, provide updates, and present a report to the committee on the assigned disorder. At the quarterly meeting, the advisory committee will discuss and deliberate on the evidence presented by the condition review work group on whether the disorder will be moved to the scientific evidence review. Uh, this is one of the most important meetings that the patient advocates can attend. Um, and we suggest, of course, to be able to attend in person, but if not, of course, you can do it by phone. 
if the committee votes that the condition for to move forward to the scientific review, the clock is ticking. Uh, they have nine months to return a recommendation to the ACHDNC on whether or not to add the condition to the RASP. Uh, it was said to us many times uh, that if you make it to the scientific evidence review committee that you have a very good chance of moving forward to uh, be nominated for RASP and be moved to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, generally, the committee will not send anything on to um, the scientific evidence review unless they feel like it will eventually be added. So after that, they, um, the final steps after the scientific review is done um, and the advisory committee votes once again um, if they will recommend the disorder being sent to the secretary. The secretary then needs to sign off <clears throat> on the condition being added. So we thought we'd give you some helpful tips on how to get started. Um, as many of you know, we have a lot of things that are coming up on the horizon. We've got some great technology. Um, I would suggest that if you haven't put something together now, start now. Um, having personally presented the ACHD and C several times and after consulting with many other patient advocacy groups um, with experience in the process, I put together, again, some of these tips. Um, have written comments. Obviously, I like to refer to my notes. Um, a cost analysis, pictures of the kids, a scientific advisory board member present, um, maybe a sample budget. Um, but most importantly, share your story, um, your very personal stories. Share the diagnostic odyssey, um, your fears, the late night worries um, with no sleep and with permission. Um, share the blogs of your community. Um, these are really impactful, and the committee really does like to hear these. So this is a sample cost analysis that we put together uh, for GAMT. Um, again, the difference of being able to be treated um, from birth versus um, even just a couple of years um, really brings on the delays and requires lifelong care. Um, we started by gathering information such as medical research papers, patient surveys, and put together cost analysis of early treatment versus the disability. Um, I would suggest securing a medical advisory board member or a medical expert that can attend the committee meeting with you um, and address any technical questions that you may not be able to. You might also want to attend public health meetings uh, in your own state and this will enable you to have a better idea of what to expect when you step into that ACHDNC meeting. Um, at the ACHDNC, uh, you will not be uh, able to present any um, present any audio or visual information, um, but you can hold up pictures of the children, which we thought was very effective, and certainly something like a cost analysis. Our other big recommendation is to partner with patient advocacy groups that have experience nominating a condition for the RESP, such as the Every Life Foundation, Save Babies, and us, the ACD. We're always happy to help. You might also consider attending conferences such as the ACMG annual uh, clinic genetics meeting, as well as other smaller regional conferences. Newborn screening directors, geneticists, and patient advocacy groups are all attending these, and it's a really great way to network, so we highly suggest that. Uh, have a strong patient voice. Um, build an arsenal of media resources that reflect your community's voice. Um, some examples are starting a blog uh, with entries from your community or asking parents to write personal stories to submit to local children's hospital blogs and parenting magazines. Uh, search your personal and professional networks for connections to people in public relations um, and in your community that can help build a plan in getting your disorder nominated. Basically, use the patient's stories to stay in the media and highlight the need for your disorder to be detected at birth. Uh, this was us in Georgia last week. Um, this is Carly. She was diagnosed with GAMT at eight years old. She's 18 now. She's completely nonverbal. Um, sweet girl. Love her to pieces. Um, but our suggestion is that I'm going to say um, you have to make your story personal. Um, you'll feel like you've told it a million times. I know I feel like I've told my story a million times. But don't forget the story of all the families in your community. Be sure to include them. The ACHDNC needs to hear about the individual children and their struggles, not all the wonderful things that they can do. 
They need to know about the odyssey of the diagnosis and the difficulties these children face uh, for not being diagnosed and treated since birth. Our job is to make the disorder um, in a research paper come to life, have a real life story. So start looking for community members that might have an interest in telling their story. Um, they will be a, a gigantic help to you. Um, this is my information. Um, again, I'm always happy to help, um, but I do want to encourage you all to start thinking about getting your disorder added to newborn screenings. Treatments are around the corner. Um, I personally feel like this is the most proactive approach um, in our society in helping children. Um, if more disorders were screened, more would be identified. The pharmaceutical companies would be compelled to find a treatment <laughs> um, or come up with a better one. Um, I also like to think that there's a lot of hope um, with newborn screening um, and with the sequencing and gene therapy that is being done today. Um, my dream is that the odyssey of seven years will go to seven days. So um, I think we'll be happy to take any questions now you may have. We're almost at the end of our time, but we have maybe time for one or two short questions. for the day. Uh, thank you for speaking. It was really this on. Mm -hmm. um, the question I was going to ask was, in the second presentation, you put up a slide with some statistics for incidents. Uh -huh. And um, in regards to that, how big is the, is the pool that that statistics has been, as in how many people have been tested to get those sort of newer? Those statistics were from, I think, over 350,000 babies, and then it was per 100,000. So that's where the... Right. That's and the uh, uh, just a quick second question. Yeah. Do you envisage all treatable, all treatable diseases being on that screening list? I think that whether it's the Seeker platform or some other, I think babies does envisage if there is a treatment, there ought to be a screen. I mean, there's going to be exceptions to that rule if they literally cannot be picked up in a newborn screen. But anything that a newborn screen can be done, we say, let's have it. Let's do it. Is there one more question? Okay. What do last, you think? Last question. You think, yeah? <laughs> So I'm just wondering what about the syndromes that don't have a treatment? Like where do those fit? I know that's not what you guys are focused on, but where does that fit? Like for us, my son was diagnosed at three. There's now babies that are getting diagnosed, but it's because they have confounding things. Um, and there's a huge amount of value to be um, diagnosed at birth or even as a baby. But there, but that's you know for family connections and for treatments and for tests and things. But it's not nothing's going to be fixed. So like, where does that like as far as like even a business model or like I know it's not ever going to be on Rust, but like where does that fit? Take that one. Sure. Um, so uh, Deshen muscular dystrophy ha is working on kind of creating a treatment protocol um, and using that for their application for getting their disease on the Rust. So if you have a protocol of certain um, therapies and treatments, not necessarily an FDA approved therapy treating the underlying cause of the disease, but steps that you can take to um, have better outcomes, better health outcomes for the child, you might be able to use things like that to um, apply for RUSP criteria. Is there To screen for, it, oh, that, that could be yes. I, I, I think it just depends. It, there's a, lo a big process. Um, we'll be having a RESP uh, webinar 
Um, we've got flyers up here. We're going to be doing deep dives into um, kind of how you can go about doing things and um, we can share PPMDs um, kind of their step by step. All right, we have a couple of final announcements here at the end. Thank you. So I won't take uh, too much of your time, just have a, a quick question for you. Um, those that uh, are in the room, have you seen the push notifications going out around uh, asking advocates and patients to take a few moments and answer a few questions regarding polls? Yes, show of hands. Anyone seen those? Okay, how many of those that have seen that message have taken that action? <laughs> All right, so we have a little bit of work to do. Um, if I may uh, ask you just to, after the end of the uh, survey uh, that you complete for today's session, um, go ahead and click on the agenda uh, app. And then just after the lunch event for today, under Friday's uh, portion of the agenda, you'll see the event titled Patient Advocate uh, Assessment, uh, Needs Assessment. And this is an opportunity for us as an organization to hear directly from you what's important to you, your communities, as we begin, begin preparing for 20, 000, or 2018 and uh, where we're gonna put forth efforts uh, to address your needs, whether it's through resources, materials, educations, events, things of that nature. So please just take a moment and complete those polls and those questions and we would greatly appreciate your participation. Thank you. All right. Thank you uh, to all of our panel members. Uh, this concludes the afternoon breakout sessions, uh, but if you can all jump on the mobile app and do the survey as well. Uh, let's give another hand to our panelists, please. <laughs>